Okay, and just because of the amount of antibiotics we've used and how effective they are in killing off bacteria, we've seen this huge increase doubling in the last 10 years of Clostridium difficile. Hopefully using the probiotics we'll get a decrease in that. Here's a depiction of what's going on inside the gut. You get the germs in, the etiologic agent causes some inflammation of the intestinal cells. This causes peristalsis to increase and stuff to move through faster, which means we don't digest it very well and we don't absorb it very well. Uh, it also, uh, part of that causes a temporary lactose intolerance. So we move through incompletely digested food, which irritates the intestinal cells more and you get this vicious cycle going. In infants, we can have that vicious cycle turn into chronic diarrhea. Um, and then they have this poor nutrition secondary to malabsorption because they've got this chronic diarrhea with this constant inflammation and moving stuff through. Um, and all of this, realize, produces metabolic acidosis because all of those waste products that um, are being produced are, are acidotic. And then of course they can also get the dehydration from the diarrhea, which also causes the acidosis. Oral rehydration. In the past we gave these kids gut rest and then we put them on restricted diets and we found out that's not the best way to treat it. Um, for most of these kids, we want to do oral rehydration therapy. So we put them on um, something that's got water as well as electrolytes in it. This would be Pedialyte, Infolite, or some other rehydration solution such as Gatorade for your older kids. We want to make sure they're getting um, the electrolytes and the water. And kids who are already eating, should keep eating. We do want to go with a, a bland diet, so not high fat, not high spice, but we don't want to restrict them from anything um, that they normally would have in their diet. Kids who are severely dehydrated, um, we're worrying about shock, decreased circulating blood volume, and these kids we do want to rehydrate with IVs. And that's to meet their uh, physiologic losses to replace any deficits they have and then replace ongoing losses. So uh, we're going to run them at maintenance IV plus the replacement needs that they have. And our big, uh, biggest goal should be preventing diarrhea in kids. Most of these, 70-80% are caused by viruses and that's the rotavirus family. And we have a rotavirus vaccine now. It had been introduced about 10 years ago, was pulled off the market because we saw an increase in interception, which comes up later in this chapter. It's been reevaluated, I imagine reformulated reform um, and reintroduced, and it is recommended now by both California and national immunization standards. Um, are recommending it, but it's within a very limited age frame. You have to start it by a certain age and finish it by a certain age, and if you don't do it in that age range, you don't do it. But it is recommended and it will prevent most of these. Um, doesn't cover every single rotavirus, but most of the uh, bad ones. So on these kids, we found that early reintroduction of nutrients actually they do better. So a breastfeeding baby should continue to breastfeed. We can use some of the oral rehydrating solutions to replace the losses they've had, but continue breastfeeding. Formula-fed babies, um, you can get a lactose intolerance just from sloughing of some of the cilia in the mucosa of the, the GI tract. So we may want to go with a lactose-free formula for a few days or go half strength to decrease the amount of sugar that they're getting. Um, but we want to keep introducing things to, into the gut. What we don't really want them to have are things that are high in sugar, low in electrolytes, and high in osmolarity. That would be fruit juices, soft drinks, and 
jello, gelatin. Um, just not enough electrolytes, not enough nutritional value, and that high sugar, high osmolality can trigger more diarrhea. Clear liquids, um, again, we're not getting the electrolytes. Caffeine is a diuretic. They're already dehydrated, so we want to avoid that. Broth tends to have too much sodium, so we're not uh, rehydrating them with something that's balanced. The brat diet is what we used in the past. Bananas, rice, applesauce, toast, and tea. And that is a bad choice. Now, we found that that's too low in nutrition and too high in sugars, and it can trigger more uh, diarrhea. So a normal diet for them, just try and lower fat, lower um, spices, but the foods that they're used to. Okay, so nursing implementation of uh, dehydration and diarrhea. You're going to see at Children's Hospital, we have IV, um, potassium in just about every IV. The one thing we have to be sure before we add potassium is that they're voiding. And usually the order will be, you know, potassium 20 milliequivalents per liter, which is normal physiologic potassium to add that after the first void. So we need to know the kidneys are working. If they're not, all that potassium we give them is going to build up. And then they're going to be hyperkalemic, which is life-threatening. So as long as they're voiding, they're going to be peeing out potassium at the equivalent of 20 milliequivalents per liter, and we're going to put it into their IV at the same rate, just normal um, physiologic potassium. The other thing we do is daily weights. We said weights are best measure of how dehydrated they are and strict, accurate INOs. We may have these kids NPO for a little while, and I said reintroduction of, of oral fluids and foods is the best, but if you're actively vomiting, you don't want to eat. It just triggers more vomiting. So they may be NPO for a little while, um, but that's it shouldn't be any longer than it needs to be. You may see stool sent to lab for pH and reducing substances. This helps in detecting what the germ is. Um, we want to prevent skin breakdown. Remember your diarrhea stool is very acidic. That chyme that moves through the GI system, that's what they're putting out. It doesn't stay in the, the large intestine and have all the reabsorption done, it's moving right through. So we've got a very acidic diarrhea against the skin. So we want to make sure we're putting barrier creams on and really keeping that skin um, well cleaned, well protected from the, the diarrhea. We want to prevent the spread of infection. These are almost always, or the vast majority of them are viral, spread easily, and no rectal temps. You do anything to stimulate the rectum, you will stimulate more diarrhea. Okay, changing to constipation. Constipation can be caused by a dietary problem that you're not getting enough fluid or fiber. So you not enough fiber, you just don't have the bulk to make stools. Or if you don't get enough fluid, remember you um, reabsorb a lot of uh, fluid in that large intestine. And if you haven't had in enough fluid, you're going to end up with very hard stools. We can have problems where child, children are withholding stooling, and usually this is, it's painful. They've had constipation problems in the past. They're afraid to stool because they think it's going to hurt, so they hold their stool in as long as they can, which gives it that much more time to reabsorb fluid and get larger so that it's painful coming out, and it kind of causes this vicious cycle. There may be, though, when there's constipation, a mechanical or obstructive disorder, and we'll talk about some of those. It can be stress at school. Um, maybe they're afraid to use the bathroom at school. Some of the management that we want to do is dietary changes, especially if the problem is that they're not taking enough fiber or fluids. We may want to do stool softeners, and you'll see at Children's they use Miralax um, on lots of kids who have GI problems. Miralax is chemically inert. You do not absorb it. It just goes right through you. So it's good on giving the bulk to be able to make stools on kids who need that. It's also good on 
uh, have keeping the stool in the the um, intestine long enough that you get some water reabsorption on kids who are having chronic diarrhea. So you'll see it used both ways. Hirschsprung's disease. This is one of the the problems that we may see. This is uh, it's. I don't know, more descriptive name would be congenital aganglionic megacolon. Congenital, so it happens in utero. Aganglionic, there's a portion of the intestine that has no nerve cells. Megacolon, part of the colon gets totally stretched out. The reason that happens is there's no peristalsis in a section of colon. There's no peristalsis there because there are no nerve cells to trigger that peristalsis. So what happens is that aganglionic portion of the bowel is just chronically constricted. You eat, the food gets down to that point and then just backs up above it because it can't move through. What you'll see in neonates, they, you may see retention of meconium. In an infant, you might see diarrhea. In an older child, you're going to see ribbon-like stools. What happens is a little bit of of the softer stool comes around the edges of that large impaction that they have right above the aganglionic section and that's what they're able to pass out so it's these ribbons of stool you're going to see well part of what happens is intentional intestinal distension and then ischemia where it's all stretched out the blood vessels are compressed you don't get good blood flow to that and this can lead to enterocolitis. This requires surgery. There is no other treatment for Hirschsprungs. You have to take out that aganglionic portion of intestine. It does not work. What they'll do is leave a double barreled colostomy. So the right above and right below the section that they took out, they'll make a colostomy. So the part above, that's where their stool is going to come out. The part below is just going to ooze a little bit of mucus because that's mucous membrane. We don't want to lose that bottom portion though because our goal is to do a second surgery and re-anastomose them. We also, so we don't want to leave it inside and lose it. We also don't want the germs that are normally inside your intestine just oozing out into the peritoneum. Now preoperatively, they're going to put these kids on enemas. We're going to try and get as much of that stool out of them as we can. We're going to put them on a low fiber diet. We don't want to bulk up their stools. We've got this huge stool stuck. And we're going to be measuring abdominal circumferences. Here's a picture of what you get. You can see the aganglionic portion is just small because nothing ever goes through it. And above it, it is backed up. And you have this huge distended megacolon. Here's a horrible picture that hopefully we'll never get to in the U.S., but in a, uh, you know undeveloped country, this is what would happen. It would just keep backing up and backing up. The child's really <laughs> looks uncomfortably distended, and that's just all stool backed up in the, the intestine, the large intestine there. Okay, vomiting. Vomiting is common in childhood. Kids throw up whether it's GI, respiratory, stress, whatever. It's usually self-limiting, so it rarely requires any sort of treatment. Um, we can give them anti-emetic drugs, but we want to make sure there's no obstruction. Uh, if we're considering an, uh, that there might be a possible obstruction, then we're not going to feed them. We're going to uh, make them NPO until we figure out what's going on. And I think this is where I'll stop.